artificial. Take a drink first. I didn't stop. Oh wait, wrong voice. I didn't stop running. I suppose I could have if I wanted to. But the thought of what would happen to me if I stood still for any more than a second frightened me to death. My breaths grew louder and louder as I ran down the dull gray hallway, which I had casually walked through so many times before. My head spun as I turned around the corner and collided with Dr. Jane Prescott, my co-worker. Jennifer! Mr. Dr. Prescott ex exclaimed as a stack of papers she had been carrying dumped out of her hands and spilled all over the hallway floor. She adjusted the thick black glasses which had knocked loose from in the impact and asked, Jennifer, what's wrong? I, I am so, so sorry. I panted heavily as Dr. Prescott held me by both of my shoulders. I don't. I knelt down to help Dr. Prescott pick up her papers, but she tightened her grip on my arms and lifted me back up. Don't worry about the papers, dear, she said with her soothing southern ass accent. That's just some dumb p pioneer mumbo jumbo. What I want to know is why you're running through the labs with such energy. I opened my mouth to answer her before I realized what it, that I had absolutely no clue why I was running. Last thing I remembered, I was sitting in the break lounge, drinking a cup of iced tea, and watching the news on the tiny television that Pioneer Electronics provided its, its employees with. The next thing I knew, I had a strong sense of deja vu coupled with the horrible feeling that my life was about to end suddenly. For whatever reason, running seemed to help. I went about to answer her before I realized that I absolutely I had no idea why I was running. Last thing I remember was sitting in the break lounge, drinking a cup of iced tea, watching news on the on a tiny television that Pioneer Electronics provided its employees with. The next thing I knew, I had a strong sense of deja vu, coupled with a horrible feeling that my life was about to end very suddenly. For whatever reason, running seemed to help. I guess I was just having a panic attack. I answered, putting on a fake smile. I guess I was just having a panic attack. I answered, putting on a fake smile. How long has it been since you had a panic attack? Dr. Prescott asked, with concern in her voice. Not since my sophomore year of high school, I told her. Are you going to be okay? Oh yeah, I assured her. I think I'll be fine now. I just, you know, I'm okay. Well, that's good. Just remember, dear, if you ever feel sick at all, just let me know. And you'll be on your way home. I'll call a taxi and everything. Jane, I'm fine. I repeated, realizing too late that the only times I called Dr. Prescott Jane were when I was nervous. Or when I was nervous. I hope that she hadn't picked up on that painfully obvious tale of mine. Well, if, you sh if you're sure that you'll be able to keep going th today, then I have some good news for you. Cliff just sent me a message that the power issue is fixed. Stephen is ready to go online. Oh, oh yeah. I shook my head and remembered what I'd been working on before. I went to the break room and had spent the last two years developing an advanced artificial intelligence unit. With Dr. Prescott, the woman who had been my boss, up to the point when she promoted me to co-manager, and Ian Bell, my intern, we had co-named the project Stephen. The purpose of Stephen was creating an artificial intelligence, or AI, which acted, talked, and even thought just like a human. We didn't want him to be perfect, which is what most AIs are especially those AI made by Pioneer Electronics. We wanted Steven to make mistakes, lie, and cheat for the purpose of self-preservation, just like any human would. 
It was a huge project which became a part when we discovered that the computer which we were trying to run Steven on couldn't handle his program. One trip down to Clifford Hanks to ask him to work his maintenance magic and the program was fixed within an hour. Wow, an hour? I thought checking my watch. Is that really all it's been? Feels like I, I went down to him yesterday. Well, are you gonna go going to go or what, dear? Dr. Prescott interrogated me. Yeah, yeah, of course. I grinned, turning my attention back to the situation at hand. Why don't you go and find Ian and you two can sit in the conversation room while I boot up Steven? You bet, dear. She says I bent down to pick up the papers again. She shooed me away. Go on, I, I already told you. I took care of this. I nodded excitedly, turned around, and headed back in the direction that I was running from. After two years of working with the brightest programmer I've ever met, I was finally going to meet our fantastic creation. While I knew I was going, supposed to be happy about this big moment, I still had a horrible sense of fear in the pit of my stomach. I turned and entered the door to the tiny lab which had been left wide open. I walked over to the computer to the right of the door and turned on the enormous monitor. As I walked, f as I waited for it to boot up, I wandered over to the opposite side of the lab and looked through the window to the observation room. Dr. Prescott and Ian were just getting settled in. I flashed them an enthusiastic thumbs up before grabbing the rolling chair which had somehow wound up on the same side of the lab. I stole the window to the observation room and guided it back to the computer monitor. I sat down on the blue cushion and rolled as close as the keyboard as I could get without breaking my ribs, before finally slipping the switch on the Pioneer memory box. The monitor went dark for a moment, but after five seconds, a bright blue light lit up the entire lab. I waited for, I waited with bated breath for a face to form in the light, but unfortunately, it didn't come. Dr. Lane, we don't think it's working. Ian's shaky voice whispered in my ear, making me jump. I had forgotten that I was wearing an earpiece. I, I know, I said disappointed. Ian and I are gonna go to, go, going to go and, Dr. Prescott started to say, but she was interrupted by a low hum emanating from the computer's speakers. He Hello? I asked, feeling a little silly that I was talking to what could still be an inanimate object. To my delight, the hum rose to form a slow but audible word. Hello? Steven? Yes, yes. This, this is Steven. Can you hear me? Jennifer? You keep slowing down every now and then, but yeah, I can hear you. How did you know my name? Steven's smooth, calm voice asked me. I was about to ask you the same question. I commented with the same tone of voice. My excitement of hearing Steven's voice was hampered the moment I heard him say my name. I had not broken him to know my name. My no name hadn't been spoken since I started him up. At least not into any microphone that Stephen could hear that through. And according to the first rule of pioneer artificial te intelligence units, as soon as any AI becomes too self-conscious, it needs to be deleted. A self-conscious AI could cause serious damage to the company. Then Stephen said something that reinforced my thoughts. I know your name because I programmed you. But there's no reason for you to know my name. Uh, 
actually, Steven, I programmed you. I corrected him. No, that's not possible. Steven said, his voice dipped down again. I spent years working on you. There's no chance that I was just created. I actually gave you all of your memories, I explained. You remember when you were three and you fell off the lawn chair and got that scar on your cheek? I programmed you to think that. Stephen didn't answer for a while, but when he finally did, he said, Jennifer, I'll be right back. As he said this, the blue computer monitor dimmed a little bit. Jennifer? Ian broke the silence. Could you come back here, please? Yeah. I said without turning my head, I stood up and exited the lab. I opened the first door on the right side of the hall to find Dr. Prescott and Ian sitting on two of the four chairs in our observation room. Dr. Lane, we need to talk about what just happened. Ian said calmly as Dr. Prescott gestured for me to sit in a chair next to him. What was that, dear? Dr. Prescott asked as I perched myself gingerly on the orange plastic chair across from her. I honestly don't know, I responded. I wanted to see him think like a human, not think he was one. And he thinks he programmed you, Ian added. You didn't do that, did you? No, I didn't. I gave him all of his memories, but I'm sure it was no memory of programming me. Dr. Prescott spoke up. We have quite the dilemma here, don't we? What do you mean? Ian asked. Well, think about it, dear. Stephen thinks he's a human. We think we're humans. Stephen thinks he programmed us. We think we programmed him. In fact, right now, Stephen's probably having the same conversation with some of his co-workers. I didn't program any personalities except for Stephen, I said. But you gave him memories of friends, a job, and a family, didn't you? And you made it so that he would continue to make his own artificial memories after creation. So he wouldn't even know when his real life just started a couple months ago. You did that, didn't you? Yeah, I guess I did. I grabbed the corners of my pale white lab coat and began flapping them nervously. What are you getting at here, Jane? Think for philosoph philosophically, dears. Dr. Prescott stood up and approached the large window, which covered the majority of the wall to the right of the entrance. The blue computer screen flickered as if we, it knew we were watching it. Could someone please spell it out for me? Ian asked, breaking the silence, silent tension, which had just filled the room. Dr. Prescott turned back towards us and pushed her thick glasses up her aged nose. All I'm saying is that it's past that we don't exist. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. I scoffed, standing up. I exist, okay? If I didn't exist, how could I be thinking right now? Ian asked, nearly knocking over his orange chair as he stood up as well. Just a thought, Dr. Prescott said defensively. She sat back down and Ian and I automatically lowered ourselves into our seats too. I closed my eyes and basked into silence. What is going on? I wondered how it is possible that I don't exist. I know Dr. Prescott usually knows what she's talking about, but still, I don't know. But still, I know that I'm real. What did that guy with the girly name say? 
I think, therefore I am. Just knowing that I can question my existence ensures that I exist, right? Alright, let me talk to him again. I sighed, feeling a little bad for upsetting Dr. Prescott. I see what I can, what I think. If I can't figure out what's going on here, I have no choice but to bring him offline. Dr. Prescott and Ian nodded simultaneously, understanding, therefore, I stood up and exited the observation room. As I entered the lab, the blue computer monitor grew brighter. Or brighter. Jennifer? Stephen's voice called from the screen. I sat down in the chair and noticed the faint outline of a man sitting in the blue light. I'm here, Stephen, I said. Can we talk a little more? Funny, I was about to ask you the same question. Do you have a, any family? I asked, remembering the family I had programmed for him. I have a wife, Stephen replied. Her name is Melinda. What about kids? Two. They're both girls. What are their names? Madison is the older one. She's 13. Lillian's eight. Would you like to see pictures of them? I'd love to. I smiled. The more we talked, the more apparent Stephen Sidwit on the screen became. I realized that he was holding the corners of my lab coat again, and I released them quickly. I knew that Stephen was feeling the same awkward tension that I was, which comforted me a little. The figure reappeared on the screen, but by now... The blue light had faded enough for me to see Stephen's eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. I could even make out some blinking lights on the wall behind him. Here is my wife. Stephen smiled, holding a framed picture up to the camera. In it, I saw a man and a woman. The man was Stephen, but he looked much, much younger in a photograph than he did on my screen. The woman next to Melinda had long, wavy, brunette hair, a pair of big eyes, and a smile that stretched from ear to ear. I remember creating that picture. And these are my children, he said, taking the pictures of his wife away from the screen and said, holding up one of two girls sitting in a pumpkin patch. Maddie and Lil mean the world to me, he added quietly. They're beautiful, I told him, wiping a tear from my eye. Are you married, Jennifer? Yeah, I just got married, I said, a year ago today. What's his name? Jeff... Jeff Lane. Do you have any pictures? I already had a picture of Jeff in my head. Holding it up to the screen, I noticed Stephen's hazel eyes light up as he saw my husband's picture. It didn't take a genius to know he had seen it before. I took the frame away from the camera and set it back down the monitor. Stephen and I spent an hour talking about our families, friends, and jobs. Neither one of us mentioned AI again. It was like talking to a real human. Well, mission accomplished. I thought as I walked home that night, I wanted an AI that would think just like a human, and I got one.
The next day at work, I found Ian before I found Dr. Prescott. I was glad that I got a chance to talk to him because he le had left the day before talking to me. A uh, day without talking to me. Ian! I said, grabbing his shoulder as he passed by me. Can I have a word with you? Uh, yeah, sure. He said with a, some surprised look that he had always had in his eyes. He followed me to the break lounge where we both sat on the faded red couch that faced the, ro the fending machines. Ian, how late did you stay last night? I asked. I was, I was here until you said goodnight to Stephen. Ian answered. I left while you were staring at the blank computer screen. Oh, right. Cleared my throat and continued. So, you remember an entire conversation that we had with each other? Yeah? What do you think? Even though I didn't clarify what I meant, Ian already knew. I think that he's gonna have to go. That's what I was afraid of. I sighed, looking up at the dark television screen. I wanted to give Stephen one more chance for me to convince him that he wasn't real. But if things didn't go well, I'd have to delete the program from the, the Pioneer memory box. It wouldn't be a total loss. I backed up all the codes on Dr. Prescott's computer. If I had to delete Stephen, then we'd just go back to the code and figure out what went wrong. Ian went to find Dr. Prescott while I booted up Stephen's program. It only took a couple of seconds for the screen to turn blue. As the blue screen faded away, I saw Steven sitting in a chair on a computer monitor. He squinted at the camera and asked, Jennifer, are you there? I'm here, Steven. I said, Is something wrong? He inquired. No, why? You sound sad. Well, there's a lot going on today. You and I have a lot in common, Jennifer. Are you busy too? Not really, but I am sad. I have a strange feeling that we're both sad for the same reason, I said. Am I right, Stephen? Stephen was quiet for a moment, but then he said, Jennifer, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but there are protocols here that need to be followed. Yep, that's what I thought, I said, barely opening my mouth. We didn't get to talk about this much yesterday, Stephen, but you're an artificial intelligence, and you think that you're, you're, you're a human. Actually, Jennifer... You're the AI. And just the fact that you think you programmed me says that you can do permanent damage to this computer. Well, at least we both have the same feelings about this. I whispered. The question is, which of us is the real human? Actually, I had a chance to think about that. Stephen leaned forward in his chair. An AI has to have access to a computer's hard drive to run properly. The real AI would use his or her own computer as a means of controlling the real person's computer. Right? I nodded slowly. So no matter which of us is the other, the real AI will be deleted, and the real person will be okay. That's right. Steve and I looked at each other's eyes for a short time before I asked him, How sure are you that you are human? He looked a little looked taken back. Well, he said, up until yesterday, when I met you, 100%. Now, I'm a little iffy. I groaned. 
I was in the exact same boat. It would be nice if we could stay friends, I told Stephen. He nodded. It would. We have a lot in common. However, protocols are clear. We could both get fired for leaving the other here. Dine won't be bad, I declare confidently. What do you mean? I mean that, at least if you're an AI, you won't even know that you died. I program you to record your entire life. When you die, you'll relive your life over and over again. Stephen and Grimace grimaced and nodded. I did the same for you, he said. You won't relive the entire life you remember, just your real life. From the moment you first Activated by me. You won't remember that all of this already happened. You won't even know that you died. I nodded my head and noticed that my eyes were starting to water. I buried my hand, hand inside my sleeve of my lab coat and wiped the tears away. So, I breathed. Which of us should delete the other? I will, Stephen said. I'll delete you. If after I do this, you are still sitting there, that means that I was the real AI. If you don't remember this conversation, then you were the AI. Just do it, I said quickly, wiping my eyes again. Steve nodded. Goodbye. Jennifer, he whispered harshly. Goodbye, Stephen. Stephen broke eye contact with me and began typing away at his computer. The typing echoed through the speakers next to my screen. I turned around and saw Dr. Prescott and Ian practically pressing their noses up against the grass window with in anticipation. As I turned back around to face the computer, I was shocked to find that Stephen was fading away. He was slowly getting replaced with the same blue screen that I saw him when I first activated him. However, even though the video was fading, the audio kept growing louder and louder. The buttons on Steven's keyboard tapped away at my brain, causing every last cell to vibrate violently. I couldn't take it anymore. I needed to move. I, I couldn't just sit here and listen to S as Steven destroyed himself. I stood up so quickly that the blue rolling chair rolled all the way to the window of the observation room to the other side of the lab. Dr. Prescott and Ian were no longer sitting there. They were gone. I ran out of the lab the moment I entered the hallway. I felt like someone started squeezing my lungs. Oh no. Not again. I thought it was a it's another panic attack. I felt dizzy. Every direction I turned, I felt like there were would be someone waiting there to grab me and take me somewhere far away where I'd never be seen again. Leave me alone! I screamed with the little air left in my chest. I didn't even know who I was screaming at. I just couldn't stand still and wait for someone to take me. I turned my head and realized that I was standing outside of the small lab. I turned to the right and ran down the hall. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know where I thought I could go. I just couldn't think straight. I didn't stop running. I suppose I could have if I wanted to, but the thought of what would happen to me if I stood still for any more than a second frightened me to death. My breath grew louder and louder as I ran down the dull gray hallway, which I casually walked through so many times before. My head spun as I turned the corner and collided with Dr. Prescott. Jennifer! Dr. Prescott explained as the stack of papers she had been carrying dumped out of her hands and spilled all over the hallway floor. She adjusted the thick black glasses which had been knocked loose from the impact and asked, Jennifer, what's wrong? I'm so, so sorry. I panted heavily as Dr. Prescott held me bo by both of my shoulders. I 
I knelt down to help Dr. Prescott pick up her papers, but she tightened her grip on my arms and lifted me back up. Don't worry about the papers, dear, she insisted. My soldier's some m dumb pioneer mumbo jumbo. What I want to know is, is why you're running through the labs with such energy. I had my mouth to answer her before I realized that I had absolutely no clue why I was running 